When most people think of the Middle Ages, they think of things like Charlemagne, the Crusades, and little villages teeming with plague-infested rats. However, a lot of other things happened in the Middle Ages that aren't as famous, but are just as interesting. And thankfully, none of them involved rats. So, today we're going to take a look at some crazy facts we just learned about the Middle Ages. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other historical eras you want to hear about. All right, Malcolm, let's get you in the middle. Olaf Tryggvason, also known as King Olaf I of Norway, was influential in the spread of Christianity in his country, and you would have hated for him to come door to door. His dedication to the faith exhibited itself when Norse seafarer Hraud the Strong refused to have his ship blessed by a bishop. Olaf and his men apprehended Hraud, beat and eliminated members of his crew, and then offered Hraud baptism. Hraud made a scoff of God, which we take to mean he declined the offer, so Olaf had him placed in the Middle Ages equivalent of a trap from a Saw movie. Olaf had Hraud bound to a board face up with his mouth forced open. Then, as was recorded, the king put his horn into his mouth and forced a serpent to go in by holding a red-hot iron before the opening. So the serpent crept into the mouth of Rao and down his throat and gnawed its way out of his side. And thus, Rao perished. Ouch! Game over. If you've never heard of the Drevlians, they were a neighboring tribe to the kingdom of the Kievian Rus. If you've never heard of the kingdom of Kievian Rus, it was a political force in Eastern and Northern Europe from the late 9th to the mid 13th century. And if you've never heard of Europe, um, maybe start with a different video. When the Drevlians killed King Igor I of Kiev in the year 945, Igor's wife Olga became the regent for their young son, and she understandably wanted revenge. So when the Drevlians sent messengers to invite her to marry their prince, she asked them to come back the next day for her reply. When they returned, she had her guards capture the messengers and bury them alive. So is that a yes? Olga then sent her own emissaries to the Drevlians with a message that they should send their distinguished men to negotiate with her. And since they were a little slow on the uptake, they did. Those distinguished individuals were taken into a bathhouse and burned alive. It's like that classic saying, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, burn me in a bathhouse. In another round of messaging, Olga reportedly told the Drevlians, I am now coming to you. So prepare great quantities of mead in the city where you killed my husband, that I may weep over his grave and hold a funeral feast for him. Look, we don't want to say the Drevlians were naive, but once again, they did as Olga instructed. After the feast, her men dispatched as many as 5,000 drunk Drevlians in a betrayal that was pretty betraying. After that, tricking the Drevlians started to feel too easy, so she returned to Kiev to gather forces just to wipe out the whole tribe once and for all. After a year of besieging their city, she asked the Drevlians, Why do you persist in holding out? All your cities have surrendered to me and submitted tribute, but you had rather die of hunger without submitting to leave. So finally, they all agreed to make peace. And as part of that arrangement, Olga demanded each house give her three pigeons and three sparrows as a form of tribute. And the poor Drevlians just nodded and went along with it one last time. Olga being Olga, she took the birds back to Kiev, attached a piece of sulfur bound with small pieces of cloth, and sent them back to the Drevlians with their flammable cargo. When they landed, they set the entire settlement on fire. As the Drevlians fled, Olga's men caught or eliminated every one they encountered. Her revenge was complete and the Drevlians were no more. When Olaf Halason and Torkel Hoge arrived in England in the year 1009, they brought with them more than their awesome names, namely Vikings, lots of them, more than ever before according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. And in the years that follow, Torkel, Olaf, and their fellow Viking raiders ravaged the English landscape, until King Athelred the Unready offered tribute in exchange for peace. Oh, I guess that's why they call him the Unready. Torkel and Olaf accepted, but then attacked Canterbury and received even more money from Athelred. At that point, many of the Vikings left England, though Torkel remained and befriended the king. Once Athelred and Torkel were allied, Torkel actually fought for the English when Sven Forkbeard, a name that's simultaneously both awesome and not awesome, went after England in 1013. It was purportedly during Sven's London onslaught that Olaf led the effort to tear down London Bridge on Athelred's behalf. 
alongside Torquiel and other Vikings. But some historians doubt the destruction of London Bridge ever took place, largely because there's not a word about it in the aforementioned Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. And even if something like that did happen, the exact bridge in question is unclear, because many different bridges have been referred to as London Bridge over the centuries, sort of like the Gallagher of Bridges. The 11th century Norse poet Uttar Svarta, however, included these lines in one of his works. London Bridge is broken down, gold is won and bright renown, shields resounding, war horns sounding, hild is shouting in the din, arrows singing, mail coats ringing, Odin makes our Olaf win. While it doesn't prove the story is true, some historians and folklorists believe this poetic tribute to the legendary battle is the foundation for the popular nursery rhyme, London Bridge is Falling Down. And from this legendary tale of Viking destruction, we got an absolute banger by Fergie. Ain't history grand? Basil II was a Byzantine emperor for nearly five decades, and he was nicknamed the Bulgar Slayer which should give you an idea of what his interests were. As a skilled horseman and adept general, he led his forces into battle, quashed rebellions, and fought against his Muslim neighbors. But like that ambiguous nickname suggested, it was the Bulgars who really brought out his wrath. After a Bulgarian army defeated Basil at Trajan's Gate in 986, he was determined to exact revenge. Tsar Samuel of Bulgaria tried to stop Byzantine incursions into his territory by blocking the Cleidion Pass and repeated attempts to break through failed until Basil's general, Nikiforos Fokas, circled from behind and trapped the Bulgarian forces. Thousands of Bulgarians perished at the Battle of Cleidion on July 29, 1014, as Basil attacked from the front and Nikiforos hit him from the back in an epic Bash Brothers routine. Basil took some 15,000 prisoners that day, and as the story goes, he ordered that 99 out of every 100 captives be blinded, like with a knife. The rest of the prisoners weren't completely spared, though. They still lost one eye, but were left with the other so they could lead fellow troops back to Tsar Samuel. When Samuel saw his disfigured soldiers, he was allegedly so horrified that he immediately went blind himself and collapsed. As if that wasn't enough, he succumbed to a heart attack a few months later. One of the major figures in the 13th century Icelandic myth known as the Njalsh Saga is Gunnar Hamandarsson a 10th century chieftain who was such a talented warrior that he was considered invincible. This is a helpful trait for a warrior chieftain. His skill as an archer, stone thrower, and wielder of the polearm were apparently only outdone by his good looks. However, he also had a penchant for hitting his wife, and that misdeed would come back to bite him. One day, as his enemies attacked his house, he fired arrow after arrow to hold them off. When his bowstring broke, he said to his wife, Give me two locks of thy hair, and ye too, my mother and thou, twist them together in a bowstring for me. In modern English, that translates to, Hey babe, could you and mom make me a wife hair bowstring real quick? When his wife asked why she would do what he asked, Gunnar told her his life depended on it. His wife took the opportunity to respond, Well, now I will call to thy mind that slap in the face which thou gavest me. And I care never a whit whether thou holdest out a long while or a short. Or in modern English, kick rocks. She never gave Gunnar the hair bowstring, and he was struck down soon after. In the 1260s, Persian historian Juvani noted, Of the issues of race and lineage of Genghis Khan, there are now living in the comfort of wealth and affluence more than 20,000. That's a lot of birthday cards to keep track of. Sensing that people were going to think he was full of it, Juvani added, More than this I will not say, lest the reader should accuse the writer of exaggeration, and ask how from the loins of one man there could spring in so short a time so great a progeny. In other words, the scholar knew his readers wouldn't believe him. Furthermore, how do you know how many living descendants Genghis Khan has is an excellent question for a 13th century historian. They didn't exactly have 23 and me back then. What Juvani couldn't know was that in 2003, scientists would find evidence that he wasn't exaggerating at all. That year, researchers announced their findings from a study on blood collected from populations throughout the former Mongol Empire. Evolutionary biologists analyzed blood from 16 different populations and found unusual features in the Y chromosomal lineage. They concluded that approximately 8% of the men in the region carry it and it thus makes up about 0.5% of the world total. The pattern of variation within the lineage suggested that it originated in Mongolia approximately 1,000 years ago. 
The implication was that this lineage is the male line descendant of Genghis Khan. And the reason it's so widespread is due to all of his, shall we say, conquests. Based on the global male population in 2003, about 16 million men were estimated to have DNA tracing back to Genghis Khan. Maury Povich must have been strutting down the street for weeks. Other researchers have urged caution regarding these results, noting that claims of connection are merely speculative. If true, though, Genghis Khan and his successors likely had the same number of female progeny as they did male, so their genetic legacy might have an even further reach than what the science indicated in 2003. Because women do not carry Y chromosomes, however, it's difficult to determine any potential connection. That said, women can trace their descent from Genghis Khan through their male relatives. The bottom line? No matter how you slice it, there are probably a lot of cons running around out there. Let's hope they're not full of wrath. So what do you think? Which of these stories surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.